Welcome to Atlanta Magazine. This is Claude Mancuso, and I'll be hosting a segment of the show today. We have a special guest, uh, and we're very happy to have with us Austin Thompson, which is a candidate in Lawrenceville for City Council Post 3. Uh, Mr. Thompson, welcome to Atlanta Magazine. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you. Now, as you know, we're uh, focused on the Haitian community in South, in here in Atlanta. That's yeah. who we are. That's who we care about. That's yes, who, sir. That's why you're here, that, and that's our focus. Yes, sir. So we are interested in all the issues that concern the Haitian Americans. Right. And obviously, they're, they're very similar to the issues that affects anyone in Atlanta. Yes, sir. But uh, every community has its own particular situation. That's right. So in, in essence, uh, I would appreciate you. I know you were at the recent uh, Greater, uh, Greater Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, Haitian American Chamber of Commerce, right. where you did a presentation. Yes. And was well received. And so today, I want to be able to take a step back, get to know you a little bit more. Right. Let the community know you a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about Austin Thompson and how how he got here. <laughs> well, um, you know, born in Guyana, in the, in the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, in South America, and um, in a country that's similar to Haiti. Right. The only thing is that Guyana is an English-speaking country and Haiti is a French-speaking country. Right. Um, immigrated to the United States in 1977 and grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in a largely Caribbean Latin community, right, where your, neighbor, uh, your neighbors are Panamanian, Colombian, Puerto Rican, Haitian, Trinidadian, other Guyanese, Jamaican, so on and so forth, right? So those early days really shaped me as a person who has an affinity, you know, for um, immigrants and um, those from a Latin Caribbean background, right? Um, in Brooklyn, New York, I um, spelt, spent my younger years, um, you know, where I go to, went to school and started college and I started my corporate career there. And then relocated to Atlanta, Georgia in 92, spent 15 years in New York, and I'm on uh, 30 years here in, in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area. And um, I finished up my collegiate career here, started um, a career in engineering. I've been in engineering now um, for about relatively like uh, maybe like 20 years. And um, you know, spent uh, my time working on regulatory compliance and business development and project management. And about 12 years ago, I, I expanded into uh, entrepreneurship. You know, because um, I, I had a passion for small business development, um, listening to entrepreneurs uh, speak about their dreams and their vision and where they wanted to take, you know, their business. I've been involved in politics, you know, for almost 30 years. Um, and I've supported candidates from across the gamut of the political landscape, anywhere from the presidential campaign to local county commission campaign, city council campaign, state senate representative, gubernatorial candidates. And I've uh, managed, uh, out of those 30 years, only managed two, ca two uh, candidates. But uh, the, the, the majority of the time has been spent, you know, um, fundraising and helping clients get the visibility they need, you know, uh, in order to win races. So, you know, that is the backdrop to me having um, a desire to run for office. That, in addition to many of the local issues that I see lack the representation, right? Lack the representation from those who are um, re currently representing, um, and especially in the underserved, um, uh, often ignored, uh, as I say, often ignored communities, you know, because these are the communities that are outside of the economic epicenter of the city. Right. And if you're not part of the economic epicenter of the city or if you're not part of a demographic or, a, or, or a economic uh, uh, community, you know, that's that's uh, benefiting from uh, the city's decisions, then oftentimes you're left underserved. Right. So I, I wanted to provide the leadership that we're, we're actually was lacking in the city. You know, uh, we're looking at economic development, looking at transportation options uh, for the city in helping to alleviate traffic, helping to improve the environment, right? Taking more cars off the street, right? And, and, and um, having a shuttle or shuttles around the city, right? Operated uh, that are battery powered or electronic vehicles, right? Looking at 
adding living wage jobs to the, the uh, employment landscape of the city, uh, providing opportunities for those who are living with the city um, and our students who are at neighboring colleges, Georgia Gwinnett College or Gwinnett Technical College, and offering them living wage jobs that are provided either by the city or by private uh, companies that have relocated into the city, working to help improve the living conditions of our lower income communities and providing opportunities for our immigrant community, right? Small business development as well and entrepreneurship and working to make sure that our African American, uh, Latino, LGBTQ, uh, women owned businesses, Asian businesses are getting the, re the, 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 the representation that they really need to grow their business successfully. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a full um, platform on representation, right? Because uh, as I go around the community and I speak to many of the residents in the city, they complain about the things that just don't get done because a focus is not being put on their neighborhoods or in their communities, right? So I want to be able to bring parity and, and, and equity to those, those communities. Is there a specific <clears throat> area um, in Lawrenceville as far uh, uh, whether it be education or whether it is uh, 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 any one of the, that you had mentioned, is mm -hmm. it specifically something that it will be on, on your top ten list that needs to be taken care of once you arrive at that city council seat in Fort Lawrenceville? If you can give me the top three, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Well, our, the residents in our lower income communities are, um, you know, really concerned about gentrification. Right? They're, they're concerned about the overdevelopment of the city, which is driving, you know, uh, home values up, um, could cause a, t a, a, a rise in property taxes. Gentrification, as you know, causes displacement. Investors come in and they want to develop, you know, and uh, I'm, I am pro-business, I am pro-entrepreneurship, so I'm, I'm not against development. But the one thing I think we need to be really mindful of is that many of our legacy residents, those who are, have been here for generations, their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents grew up in these areas. So we have to be mindful of the fact that we can't cause a massive displacement in our, in our lower-income communities. The other thing is our small business um, uh, community right now has been decimated by COVID-19. Many of those are minority businesses. Minority businesses have actually um, have been closed at a higher rate than any other business, right? And now, um, since this, uh, this program addresses issues or we, we're speaking about issues that impact the Haitian community, we have to be mindful that there are Haitian-owned businesses in our city of Lawrenceville that have been impacted, right? Uh, restaurants or um, other retail outlets. So we have to be mindful of the fact that these businesses require the services, they require the access to resources, as with any other business, in order to ensure their long-term sustainability um, and success, right, in their respective businesses. The, the other thing is, and, and, that, and, that, and that helps to contribute to a healthy economy, the local economy, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing I mentioned, um, you, know, um, you know, with living wage jobs and providing living wage jobs, we just have too many residents. Now, Lawrenceville has a 24% poverty rate, which means about, that translates to about, uh, about 6,400, right, who are living in poverty. Um, so we have to be mindful that if we had more opportunities or more access to living wage jobs, not just jobs that pay $7 an hour, $8 an hour, but anything that's north of, five, uh, of $15 to $18 an hour will really help our residents in this city of, of Lawrenceville and where the the homes now are selling at 300,000 per unit apartments are being rented a one-bedroom apartment easily will rent for one fifth uh, fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred dollars a month so we, we really have to be mindful of um, how we're developing and how we're um, um, affordable housing um, affordable housing isn't affordable to, every, to everyone, right? So we just have to be mindful of those things. So those are the three top things, in addition to transportation and code enforcement, working with our police department to ensure that um, policing um, is done in accordance with uh, uh, fairness to everyone, 
right, and making sure that um, everyone in our city feels safe and are treated equally. I can tell you, I've lived in Haiti for 33 years. And, right. Uh, we, we see the state of Haiti as it is, and mm -hmm. it's because mm -hmm. uh, everybody functions with impunity in right. Haiti. Right. Lawlessness and, and uh, an incapable police force to be able to control gangs. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the rhetoric of the last year or two mm -hmm. with the this, this fund the police uh, was very scary yeah. to our community yeah. because there's the last thing we want to do is defund the exactly. police. Exactly. I think that's the craziest notion we can imagine. Now, now definitely educate the police, uh, inform, mm -hmm. try to weed out. And I think that that has been, to me, the solution has always been, and it's been yeah. in action, is when you name a, a black police chief mm -hmm. and he can't figure out mm -hmm. who in his department uh -huh. are, are the wrong people. Right. Uh, then how do you how do you want anybody else to figure it out? That's <clears throat> exactly. That's what you put a, a black police chief and, and and let him do what he needs to do. Yes. And I think that even in a situations uh, like that, people are people. There are good people of yeah. every of every color, and bad. And so I think that at the end of the day, uh, it, it is extremely important. Right. For our community to feel to con to continue to feel safe because exactly. the the fund the police reduce the police some of the craziness we've seen in in some of the cities and out west and so mm -hmm, forth mm -hmm. uh, very scary to to many of us yeah now i've i've never been um one to fall into line with defunding the police right removing funds re re you have a budget <clears throat> And you have line items on the budget, and you're eliminating line, line items from the budget, right, to defund resources for the police. What I am in favor of is redirecting some of those funds for training, right, sensitivity training, emotional intelligence training, uh, training on um, community policing, right? We in Lawrenceville just hired um, an engagement officer. Who, who actually, whose job is to engage the community, right? And also uh, underserved communities as well. Over the period of the last few years, and even going back to the Rodney King beating, and even prior to that, because um, African Americans uh, in uh, lower income communities have complained for years about bad policing and mistreatment from the police. But over the past decade, we've seen like a, a, a tremendous spike in police shootings and killings of unarmed black men and women. So you can understand the fear of police, and you can, uh, you can understand the passion that envelopes that whole concept of defunding the police. Now, we need our police, right? The police promises, they already pledge it, uh, to, to serve and protect, right? Yes, there's, there's bad police officers. There are officers who um, join the police force for whatever reason, right? But they're, they're good cops. The bad ones are the minority, right? They're the minority. You know, they say, they say one bad apple can spoil a bunch, right? So I feel that if we had programs and training, right, um, on how we can, you know, um, build better relations with between the police and the community, build better partnerships, right? Recently, I, I was listening to an interview on um, how, how uh, different cities and municipalities are dealing with working with the police to de-escalate tension, right, between the police officers and the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. Young people should not see, or anyone, any individual, should not see the police as an enemy. Right? The police is not the enemy. They're there to protect. And the police should not see um, uh, a black and brown person automatically as uh, a person of interest. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Let's just, let's just, let's just um, make it plain. A person of interest or a suspect. You know, in New York, they had the program Stop and Frisk. Right? And it was largely targeted to blacks and Hispanics. Right? So we don't want to see uh, these types of programs and activities. Right? It, you know, but the reality is that crime in New York went way down. Yes, yes. So yeah. there was a result. Yeah. Right, it right. Wasn't, it wasn't just systemic uh, uh, attack on, on African Americans. It, it wasn't. Was, it was specifically 
focused on, and and, and, and I, I did, you're from there. I'm not, so right, you would right. know more than I did. I, I, it, yes. it, it, yeah, there's there's collateral damage when yeah, you do anything like exactly. that. Exactly. For sure, yeah. the rights were, were trampled on. Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, uh, the end result of the crime uh, was went way down when New York right. became one of the safest cities in America. Right. Now, of course. Uh, uh, there's a pop, maybe a better way to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree. There's no doubt, but there's, you, nobody can deny the results. Right. What I'm interested in is, mm -hmm. is, is specifically the Haitian community. Uh -huh. um, uh, where do you see? Uh, where do you see a role, uh, or possibly uh, appointing a, a, a community liaison or mm -hmm. something like that? <clears throat> where do you see that that uh, that the Haitians can have a bigger role in Lawrenceville? Now, appointing community liaison is actually part of my plan, right? Especially those who will help us engage have, or have better engagement in communities that feel underserved and underrepresented. At the, at the event where we discussed the Haitian policy agenda, I spoke of the success that another municipality, Clarkston, Georgia, um, is having with their refugee resettlement program, right? Lately, we've seen what was happening at the border We've seen the migration of thousands of Haitians um, coming through Colombia, through Central America, into Mexico with hopes of getting into the United States. And this is going all the way back to the 2010 earthquake, right? Not just, you know, the recent events with the assassination of Jovenel Moise and, and, and the uh, hurricane afterwards, but this is going all the way back to the 2010 earthquake. And I have actually worked with the Haitian community in helping to um, generate uh, funding for certain programs. I've worked with Sorel Katan and the Haitian Alliance before he um, went to the Georgia Haitian um, American Chamber. And I would like to investigate um, and do some research on how we can have a program like that here in the city of Lawrenceville, right? How we can have um, uh, Lawrenceville be a safe haven for Haitians who are um, trying to find a place that they can raise a family and live a, lead a productive life, right? Many, many are right now caught up in a transient state in, in South America and Central America, and they're just not settled, right? Clarkston has been successful in their refugee resettlement program, right? So being that I'm familiar with the mayor, uh, the, the mayor at that time, right? Um, Ted Riley, uh, um, Ted Riley, um, and the current councilman Owet Iyasu, who who were overseeing that you know the implementation of that program, I would love to sit with them and, and try to see how we can develop that even more. What what I believe is <clears throat> forgotten in all of this process mm -hmm. is that most of the Haitians that are here now mm -hmm. went through a legal process. Right. Mm -hmm. They applied legally, they waited yes. for years, they, yes. they did what they had to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that either we are a country of laws, right. or we go back to what Haiti is, mm -hmm. which is a country where all the laws are not respected. Right, right. So, if you're going to decide to open up a border, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to go against the existing laws of the United States, Yes. Isn't the first process to go ahead and change the laws? Yeah. Right. So if you don't work towards the process of changing the laws, mm -hmm. you allow everyone, mm -hmm. Haiti or wherever, yeah. to mm -hmm. come through with no vetting, with no process. You are basically laughing at the, pro the legal process, mm -hmm. which allows I mean, everyone can mm -hmm. apply. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of processes, right? And and they do, right? Uh, the economic situation in Haiti is disastrous. Yes, mm -hmm. it's been caused mm -hmm. uh, in many ways by the administrations. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, the Clinton administration mm -hmm. killed the economy in Haiti mm -hmm. through their rice uh, uh, situation. Uh, with with the, all the rice from Arkansas mm -hmm. came in and flooded the market mm -hmm. uh, to make uh, kill, you know Bill Clinton's friends rich. At the same time, Hillary brought in, pushed a president that wasn't to be a finalist, mm -hmm. made him number two, so that he became president. Mm -hmm. Another one of the, that ripped off the country tremendously. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's no doubt mm -hmm. that if Haiti needs to go in a special 
a special we can recognize the damage the United States has done mm -hmm. to the situation in Haiti. Right. Uh, and, and we, I mean, it goes back to the American occupation, well, uh, which, yeah. which destroyed the, all the ports. Many the times. Port. Many uh, times, yeah. So, yes, if yeah. you want to create a special mm -hmm. law for Haiti, like they did with the Cubans, right. they mm -hmm. gave them you know, a free, <clears throat> asylum. easy yeah. asylum. Yeah. If you want to do that legally, mm -hmm. then I'm good with that. Yeah. But I think that to just go ahead and open and let everybody in mm -hmm. uh, with the understanding that uh, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the victims, mm -hmm. the people that were invited, because mm -hmm. they didn't just come mm -hmm. because they thought it was a good idea. They right. were invited right. by the administration to come because we're going to open that border and you're going to come in, you're going to be all right. Well, most of the people that went from Chile or wherever they ended up mm -hmm. during that whole caravan right. were either raped, mm -hmm. were ripped off, yes. uh, 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 some were killed. Yes. So they were the, the victims of the coyotes mm -hmm. because it's that's the only people that won in this process. Yes. And then when they got here, all of a sudden, uh, a lot of them were shipped back. And some of them were were were, were transported illegally, mm -hmm. you know, by the administration to different cities so they right. can integrate and just, you know, bring them in. Right. To me, there's there's something wrong, morally, with that process. Mm -hmm. Now, I am with you. Mm -hmm. Don't want to see Haitians suffer. No, no, no. But either we're a nation of laws or <clears throat> we're not. Yeah. So let's work on changing the law or mm -hmm. doing a special situation for Haitians because they've been victim. Right. Of recent administrations right uh and then yeah then we can work that out right but, but i think that those who went through the legal process mm -hmm. that have been here that went through years of requesting bringing their family and doing right. it illegally right i think it's an insult to them right that the others can just come through like that 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 is how i feel about it well yeah and um and it's unfortunate i'm not running for a u.s senate seat or a u.s you know congress seat uh, where I will be involved in that legislation. But what I can do is, on a local level, mm -hmm. making sure that we are creating um, a safe environment for our Haitian immigrant families, right? And again, working to see how much more we can do. If there are federal programs that we can, you know, weave into the programs we already have created in the city, like what we're doing now with the Lawrenceville Resource Center and with Impact 46, which helps um, to provide funding for disadvantaged families. You know, I can see how we can, we can you know, help to create those opportunities. You know, I, I'm an immigrant myself, right? I'm an immigrant myself. I didn't get here, um, you know, by way of um, fleeing my country, but I'm an immigrant. And um, having many friends who are from Haiti, having family members who are from Haiti, right? And being from a Caribbean region that has seen this played over time and time again, you know, I can, I can empathize, you know, Haitian, with Haitians, with a Haitian family. And knowing that all they're trying to do is to, to, to get the quality of life that everybody else is enjoying, right? Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, and it's unfortunate, but you have people who flood the borders because they're trying to get to that other side. You know, they say, if you come to America, you can be anything and do anything you want to do, right? And you have immigrants who have come to this country and have prospered well. So they see that. And they see that and they say, hey, I want a piece of that, you know? And if I was in, in, in that situation, I'd probably be part of that caravan too, you know? Oh. But, but what we got to try and do, I know, is, is to, Make sure that we do have those, those immigration laws in place where we can help, you know, uh, Haitian refugees get to certain parts of the U.S., get their immigration status, become citizens, become productive citizens, and be able to start businesses, work, raise a family, so on. But that's one thing that the yeah. Haitians have become. Not yeah. only are they... They're a great example oh, yes. of, 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 of the American dream oh, and yes. the immigrant. Oh, yes. And I think that uh, at, at every level, whether it's education uh, in South Florida, it's been many years in South Florida, which right. is 400, mm -hmm. over 400,000 Haitians yes. in South Florida. Yes. I know that community well. Mm -hmm. They've done, uh, uh, even though the parents may know how to, may not know how to read and write, mm -hmm. and they, can, they came on a boat. Right. Their kids are in college. Yes. And the kids are 
advancing, and, yes. and uh, whether they're whether they're becoming doctors and engineers, yes. uh, or, or it, it's we, the American dream. We've got over thirty, about thirty-five Haitians in the NFL. Right. Yes. You know, so they, <laughs> yeah. and basketball, we got a, 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 over a dozen. Yes. So, yes. so, so I think that. They see opportunities, whether it's sports, whether it's education, whether it's right. all those fields, and I think that um, they're the they're the great one of the best examples mm -hmm. of immigrants. Um, uh, in in essence, I think that is important. Right. But I do want to remind everyone that they understand that we're a country right now of over three hundred and thirty three million. million. Mm -hmm. There's about seven hundred million people mm -hmm. worldwide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That all want to come here. Yes. Yes. So, if we let them all in, mm -hmm. we'd have a billion people mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to tell me, yeah, well, we got land, <laughs> but look, look at the inflation already. <clears throat> exactly. If we knew, were going to bring them all in, and then take care of their health, right? Take care of this, mm -hmm. their education, mm -hmm. the housing. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, I think all of us, will, this this country, will become a, a third world country, right. if not a fourth world country. So right. we have to be understanding mm -hmm. of the reality of it's not just about these people want to get here right. and make an effort to get here. Right. We have to understand are we going to have laws limiting it or not? Yes, That's yes. All. And 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 you know, I've I've uh, grown up in Brooklyn, New York from 1977 to 1992. I've been around many Haitian families. And out of that many Quite a few of them were doctors, mm -hmm. college professors. They were police officers. They joined the police force. They were restaurant owners, business owners. Nurses. Uh, nurses, teachers, right? And their children were being encouraged to, because the children now were, were first generation Americans, right? Those are the ones I grew up with, mm -hmm. right? Their parents were the ones that immigrated, like my parents and I immigrated from Guyana. Legally. Legally, legally. But again, you know, Guyana didn't go through what Haiti is going through, right? Um, but every every country, every country has a right to protect its borders, right? It has a right to, to secure its borders. And it manages the number of immigrants they take in. Guyana takes in Haitian immigrants, right? Guyana does. And it provides land for Haitian refugees, right? So my own country of birth is doing it. Right? And several other countries around um, the, the Caribbean and South America. Right? The thing is, if America, the brand of America is you can become anything. You can come here and you can do anything. That brand continues to be promoted. And with, uh, with, with the, the proliferation of television and television stations, people around the world continue to see how we're living. And then, of course, you have TV shows that's portraying people as millionaires and celebrities. And when you're selling that to developing countries, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, they're going to want to come here. Because they're going to think, oh, my, if we go to America, we'll be rich, just like that guy on that TV show. And we, so, uh, so we're going to see that. And we could be one of the obnoxious <laughs> uh, uh, you know, wives of Atlanta. You know, yeah, that, that, well, that, yeah that, exactly. Wives of Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and it uh, perpetuates something that is just not real no, for everybody. Exactly. And that's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Now, let's close by yes. giving you an opportunity to go ahead and tell the Haitian community that is watching us. Yeah. Um, specifically, a message that you'd like to share with them. Right. The election is November... November 2nd. 2nd. So, yes. um, this is the time. This yeah. is the time for them to... To get someone who's going to support them, it's yes. always important. Yes. Um, to take some, if, and I always tell them, if it's not a Haitian that's running for that seat, mm -hmm. then it's who who is going to be, who understands the Haitian experience. Yes. And and that's, we're giving you the the chance to do that. Right. I may not be a Haitian. I may not speak French. I may not speak Creole. But I'm an immigrant from South America. I'm an immigrant from the Republic of Guyana. And Guyana is, is, is a country that has immigrants or from which immigrants come to America with the same passion as, an, as a Haitian immigrant. To do good in America, to live well in America, to contribute to the development of America. And 
to go to school and, and to, to build a life for their family. I am running to represent the underrepresented, to represent the underserved, and to represent the often ignored. As a city councilman, I will represent our Haitian community because we are from, we are from the Caribbean. We have, we're, we're from a shared region. And again, I may not be Haitian, but I'm a Caribbean brother. I'm a pan-Caribbean individual. I am looking out for everyone who feels as if no one else has looked out for them. And I want to make sure that we, we, we have policies that can put forward an agenda for affordable housing, can put forward an agenda to welcome companies into Lawrenceville that provides living wage jobs for our community members, to ensure that our small business owners, especially coming out of COVID, where so many businesses were decimated, over a million businesses closed, and over 150,000 businesses will not return. And I'm sure many of those are Haitian-owned businesses. So I ask you for your vote. I ask you for your support. I know that I will be open to you, and you can be open to me. The, the, the channels and the lines of communication will be open. I want to build a partnership with the Haitian community. I want to build a relationship, or I should say continue a relationship with the Haitian community, because I already have a relationship with the Haitian community. But now I will have that relationship as an elected official. And you will have someone at, at the seat of decision making to represent you. Austin Thompson, Lawrenceville City Council Post 3. I will serve as your representation. I will make sure that we have a line, open lines of communication to where we can build that partnership and build that relationship. I want to make sure that every Haitian living in Lawrenceville has the quality and the standard of living that everyone else has. So let's work together. I ask you for your vote on November 2nd, and I ask you for your support. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you very much for being my guest. Thank you. This has been um, Atlanta Magazine. That's our show for today. Atlanta Magazine, every month, will give you the best of what's happened in Atlanta. So stay with us for the next issue next month. Merci. À bientôt.